Hi guys, welcome back to another episode. We're down here at Rotary Revs and today is a very special moment for me. Personally. Because I'm sat with the main man of Rotary Revs, <laughs> Ben. And some of you may know him, some of you don't. This is a perfect opportunity now to get to know Ben and a little bit of a back in history of Rotary Revs and the direction it's going to be going in. So. Hi everybody, I'm Ben. And uh, this is this is Rotary Revs. So this is my company and Abbo's asked me to sit down with him today and actually get in front of the camera, which is something that obviously we've, we've never done for you before. So um, we're going to talk about Rotary Revs. We're going to talk about where it's been, where it is, where it's going, what it is to me, and um, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting getting chatting about it. Yeah. So, what do you want to know? So, like, I think a good good way to start it would be, well, how did Rotary Revs start? And how is it? Okay, yeah, no, I'll tell you. So, yeah. Rotary Revs, Rotary Revs was actually originally called Rotary Revolutions, but I decided that that was too long to have as a um, as a name, and and so it were exactly that. It brought a revolution. It was it was supposed to be. It was having a fight back at the piston engines, um, and it all started with my own car. So we're going back to like 2007, 2008. I bought my first RX8, and the well, I started having trouble with it. Obviously, like we've all got RX8s. I assume if you're watching this video, you know how these things go, and. Uh, it, I thought, because everybody told me that it had low compression and the engine was poorly and so on and so forth, and I rang my local Mazda dealer and asked to book him for a compression test and they wanted an obscene amount of money for the job. And I thought, well, you can bollocks, I'm gonna do it myself. And so I did. Uh, at the time, the RX8 Arms Club UK were a really big deal. And I'd got involved a little bit, so I bought myself a compression tester. And once I'd done my own compression test, and in this particular instance, my engine was fine, I started offering to the wider community compression tests um, for you know 20 quid or whatever, literally at my mum and dad's house. And it, I guess it just spiraled from there. A couple of years later, I jacked my job in. I built a couple of engines at home in my garage for. Um, family and friends, I guess. And then uh, it just it just went crazy, I guess. Uh, before I knew it, there were cars parked up down the street. There were, I was making a mess of my mum and dad's house and, and I had to go out and, and get myself a unit, which obviously gave me responsibilities and the rest is history, I suppose. You know, I had a really good few years. We used to build dozens of engines monthly and you know, now we're two, two and a half thousand engines in as a business and things have changed significantly. So yeah, that's that's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. So how, how would you say it's changed then significantly? Uh, so, it, well, I mean, it started out as a hobby, yeah. <laughs> turned into a business. Um, I've processed, you know, thousands of customers. I've met some amazing people. I have gone through all of the stages of development that you'd expect to go through as a performance rotary shop. So I started out obviously doing engine repairs, um, then obviously with a natural progression to get into uh, vehicle modification. So we were chasing lap times back then, you know, we used to love us track days, we'd go 10, 20, 30 strong to uh, a track day at Donington Park or Blyton or wherever and uh, race his cars around and then drive them home at the end of the day. Now, everybody knows that you know chasing power in the RX-8 is, is, is a bit of a dead end um, thing to, to do, I guess. It's hard, you know, like uh, some of the new markets that we're in now, we can do software only and get 200 horsepower. Uh, the RX-8, you know, you're chipping away, hammering away for every one horsepower, it's every two horsepower. And then you can lose five horsepower on next run just because it's got a bit warm. So I think getting onto power, getting onto engines and power and uh, porting and what have you. So we obviously RX-8 specialist originally that evolved then uh, natural progression, whether or not I wanted it to happen is relevant. RX-8, RX-7s obviously started turning up. Um, we were exposed to various different types of port work, turbo builds, tuning, um, 
all of those things that the Rotary community is, is both known for and has a huge lack of access to. Um, I felt the pressure quite early on to be able to, to start providing these kinds of services to, to the community in, in the UK. So, um, you know, if we, if we want to go right the way back, Everyone's, everyone's heard of a bridge port. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I cut the first half bridge port into an RX-8 iron that I know of in the whole world 10 years ago, back when RX-8 Club, RX-8 Owners Club UK, the, all of the forums, and that's where everybody hung out back then, um, swore that it couldn't be done. So I, what, lie, it was messy. <laughs> the first one never actually made it into an engine. It was a few years later that we cut the first half bridge and it went into an engine. <clears throat> um, and that car went, it were a Nordic green car, it went over to Pip Gardeners over at WGT Auto Developments for tuning on his dyno. Uh, we didn't offer tuning uh, services back then. And yeah, I mean, uh, the results were, well, I don't really know, I can't tell you. I mean, they were not, you know, like it was somebody else's dying now, it was just as it was. Yeah. Um, that ultimately evolved into a full bridge port. So we cut the first full bridge port and that was around about the time that we bought our own dyno. So we started doing his own testing and trying to work out what was working, what wasn't working. Some of those engines, you know, they do 20, 30,000 miles. They were, they were good engines. They had really light wraps. I mean, the, the ports, the, the eyebrow, were only 3.6, three 3.8 millimeters wide. Um, so I'm not talking tiny little ports so that the corners of piece of the Apex seals, won't, there were no risk of them falling into them. Uh, around about that time, I also moved into the office. So I spent a lot, a lot less time out on the shop floor, uh, more time dealing with customers. And I handed over to my right hand guy, D, who I think you've all seen. So yeah. I'm on the Car Throttle channel and videos and what have you. Um, and D picked up where I left off and started developing and pushing the Rotary Res Bridgeport template further. Uh, as eyebrows got up to something like five and a half millimeters wide, uh, they got longer, shorter. We tried every which way that you could to extract more power out of the RX8. We've uh, experimented with different styles of exhaust porting, not touching exhaust ports to try and improve torque. You've got to imagine that whilst we were going through all these development processes, yeah. we were actually learning um, as we went along, not just about porting, but also about how engines work, how to read a dyno graph. That's a really important skill when you're, doing, yeah. when you're tuning cars, you know? Um, what really matters? Are we chasing those peak horsepower numbers or would we prefer an extra 10 foot pound of torque in mid range? This is all really, really important stuff and it makes huge differences to the way that a car drives, to the way that a car performs. And over those years and years, we narrowed it down and narrowed it down and narrowed it down and, and we finally started to get the drift that, you know, it's that old adage, horses for courses. Um, you know, if you want a race port to go racing with, that makes perfect sense. If you want a race port to drive around that road with, it's going to be expensive. We're going to get to know each other well. You know, the regular engine strip downs are not an uncommon thing. And, um, and I guess it is what it is. I think we had a bit of a turning point two or three years ago where we had established that we'd hit a wall. So, the, we, you know, we could make, consistently make an extra 10, 15, 20 brake horsepower cutting a bridge port, but we were sacrificing seven, eight, 12 foot pound of torque in the mid range, wow. and needing to rev an engine out to 10,000 RPM in order to be able to make any kind of um, return on, on that investment and development. Uh, terrible fuel economy, smelly exhausts, um, Braps, which, you know, obviously it's a rotary favorite and, and I appreciate that as a fad, but the reality is living with Braps on a day-to-day -day basis, driving it to work and back is just, well, you know Apple as well. Yeah, you? I've, I've, <laughs> it's, a, I've it's not very practical. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if you're wanting obnoxious and, uh, and, and that's all that matters to you and you want loud, brappy, Bah, 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 and you want to feel like you're driving around in a 1970s group being rotary, then uh, then yeah, 
perhaps of the way forward, I suppose. But the reality is, for the amount of actual power that it makes in a naturally aspirated RX-8 engine, there are far more drawbacks yeah, yeah. than there are positives. And um, like I say, <laughs> I've got you know that, don't yeah, you? So, so, you know, we've, we've kind of got to the extremes of what you'd class as a, a bridge port. Uh, for the side exhaust port Renesis engine <clears throat> and we were looking for um, you know is there further to go and so we started developing a new style of port that uh, basically opened up the exhaust ports, reintroduced um, exhaust overlap across the irons and what that did was it induced a huge amount but it didn't really do anything for power. Yeah. Nothing at all, in fact. Um, but the community got wind of it. Yeah. They liked it. They liked the way that it sounded. They liked, they liked the way that it looked. I think, what did we dub it? The race extension? Yeah. You had one? I had one. You had one? Yeah, man. Um, what did the race extension do? So, <laughs> what were your experience of it, Abba? Some, Can you confirm some of what I've said today? Yeah, definitely. I feel like with the with the race extension, I was um, I was drawn to the Braps as opposed. Well, to yeah, yeah. So it, it, it were a fad, and yeah. it is a fad. Um, we can still do it, but the reality is, the race extension port never left the development bench. It did. It's in customers' cars. It's in people's cars. Um, but it was never finished before people found out about it, found out that uh, it did what it did in that it induced an old school race car type wrap. And, um, you know, I think I remember you, did you, didn't you make a series on your own channel? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, did you finish it? No, I didn't. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it didn't make it didn't make the power that I was um, I was hoping for. So you never put it out there, did you? No. I mean, I think that when we put it, we did. So that engine's now moved on to somebody else, hasn't it? And yeah, someone else was going to be actually using it for the right purposes. Well, for what you wanted it for originally, and, yeah. and it is what it is. And I think with a new set of coils on it and stuff, it did break that 200 brake horsepower. Yeah, it well, did. 200 wheel horsepower barrier. So yeah. we're talking it's a 200 and. 230, 240 yeah, yeah. brake horsepower engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It was it was one crazy journey that I've been through. Um, <laughs> I've experimented. You with drove it with it, you know. You drove it for a good couple of years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was. I loved it. I did um, yeah, we always knew when Abbott pulled up outside in Zara. Yeah, you, you were definitely. Bah, 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 <laughs> you knew. Um, Eighteen hundred RPM idle. Yeah, it was. It was quite high. How many times did your dad shout at you for? Yeah, dad's in the house out. Yeah, dad's neighbours. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, I feel you know, like the thing is, is you watch these cars on YouTube and you think, fuck me, that looks fucking sick. It's yeah, yeah it. that's I want it. that in my life. And, that is it. Um, <laughs> and you do. I, I did. Uh, that's why I started putting Bridgeports originally. Mm. Um, maybe I've just got older. Yeah. Or maybe I've just experienced it enough times to know that as fun as it is in the moment or on that one drive a year that you go out for a drive with your mates, yeah. it gets really frustrating people asking you at the petrol station, why does your car sound broken? I've had that many, many times, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, call me old and boring if you like, but, you know, we've, we've got a... I've gone down an entire development process that's taken me 10 years. I've invested hundreds of thousands of pounds into equipment yeah. that's uh, allowed me to, to go through that process yeah, definitely. systematically and measure changes as we make them. And um, at the end of all of that, we finished up with a, a, a solid dead end where we'd made Little to no extra power of uh, a really well-built, high compression. Uh, compression, I mean, that's a big thing. You start chopping these ports up okay. and, you know, these some of these engines will make four, four and a half bar of compression. Mm. Running, you know, like that's... Yeah. The, yeah, the, so whilst you're trying to introduce all this extra airflow, you're chopping away at that thing that 
also this is so vitally important to make torque and so um, you know a high compression well built blueprinted stock port engine will make the kind of torque figures and you know guys torque is what we're measuring really that's that's, yeah, what, that's what power is power is torque we can get into that in a video uh, one day when I'm, you know, we'll talk about how to read a dyno graph and yeah. stuff like that. Um, in this series of videos that we're gonna that we're gonna let you have. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, so you know, I, <laughs> drawbacks, 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 and I haven't even quite touched on the thing that for me matters the most now. So you know, ten years in, when I started rotary revs, there were twenty six thousand. Mazda RX-8 on the road in the UK and I'll split up something like 8,000 just off the top of my head, 8,000, 192s, um, 12, 14,000, 231s, a few PZs, a few 40th anniversary cars and uh, obviously the Evolve and, um, and then the R3. I think there were 750 R3s. Well. Yeah, so yeah. there were never very many. They only sold them for what, two years? Something like um, that. They finished the run early and then they released the Spirit R in Japan uh, for a single hit run. And there's a rumour that there's one or two of those over here in the UK, but I've never seen one. And um, so, yeah, you know, there were, there were plenty of cars we could afford to be, I mean, I was buying two, three second hand engines a week to keep the cars that people were fixing going. Um, they got broke at a rate that you've probably, when I say broke, they basically chopped up for parts to keep other cars going. A rate that um, I've never seen or heard of before or since, you know, and as a result now, uh, the 2000 and th from 2003 to 2012 when it peaked and then coming back down now to 2021 there are less than two and a half thousand RXAs left in the UK. So for me, taking a set of R3 irons that I'd call, so in the RX7 community we talk a fresh, we, we call a fresh set of RX-7 uh, engine irons, virgin irons, so these are the ones that weren't butchered during the noughties, that yeah. weren't cut up for terrible port designs, that weren't messed with, that have literally just been stripped once and they're now ready to be built into a proper engine today. Um, taking a set of irons out of a perfectly good RX-8 R3 engine and butchering them to turn them into some faddy, brappy, um, Paw yeah. is it's sacrilege, you know, and anybody who's genuinely interested in rotaries needs to today look at that and think, you know what, actually, if I love rotaries, they might never bring another one out. What we've got is what we've got. The last thing I need to be doing now is building a, a sketchy race engine that may or may not last 12 months or more. And, you know, these part, these, these irons are what, seven, six, seven hundred pounds, six, seven hundred dollars, wherever you are in the world, each. Um, people are throwing cars away rather than replacing them. And so getting his hands on good quality second hand irons is paramount to keeping the cars on the road. And if any of you are serious about maintaining rotaries, about loving rotaries, as good as that brap is, they don't do anything for you except give you a brap and it's certainly doing anything at all for keeping the cars on the road. So, you know, for me, and this is a big part of what you wanted to talk about today, I think Absolutely. I both, yeah. for me, um, I'm, I want to do a, a huge direction change for the community. I want to um, concentrate on maintaining the cars to be as good as they can be. And that brings me on to another point actually. So I remember, back in the day when, you know, there were three, four thousand guys in the club, in the community. We all had our X8s. We'd meet up for a track day, we'd all get up at five o'clock in the morning, we'd drive to track, yeah. we'd race around for eight hours, and then we'd get back in the car at the end of the day, we'd go to, well, we'd go meet up at a pub or whatever, have a meal, and then climb back in his cars and drive it home again, and then go to work on it the next day, in it the next day, and, you know, the RX-8, the amount of times that we'd have people coming over to look at superchargers and 
oh, where's your turbo kit? And it's like, no man, this is just that little car that you turn your nose up at all the time, putting faster lap times down than your Porsche, uh, because it's, it's well balanced, because it works properly, because it makes a good driver out of anybody because if Mazda can do anything at all, it's built a, a, an awesome driver's car. And so I know what the cars were like when they were new. They were still manufacturing the R3, they were still selling them. Some of my good friends would buy brand new cars and bring them to me for servicing. I know how good they were, I know how good they can be. Uh, just being what they were meant to be. And so we've spent 10 years chipping away trying to develop faster cars and you know we've, we've put chargers on them we've built turbocharged cars and then a good idea to drop a few videos of them in doing pack dyno pulls yeah, yeah. we've tuned cars on standalone ecus factory ecus we've done bridge ports race extensions street ports regular ports you know 2000 engines in 2000 plus engines in i've seen it all um, we've also developed chassis, big brake kits, roll bars, we worked with Racing B, Petit Racing, I, I bought Petit Racing Europe. Um, <clears throat> wheels, tyres, you know, like we, we used to love tyres, mm -hmm. uh, you know, R888Rs were the, were the king, I mean, well, R888s back then. Yeah. Um, the most popular were your Federal RSR 595s, the Avons, and then, um, but I mean, it, it were widely you know, everybody knew that you took those factory Bridgestone Ario 40s off at the soonest opportunity, like that, that yes. was, that way. <laughs> yeah, been them yeah, straight away. <laughs> you know, we're going back to days at Redestein, um, uh, go on to the centers with the asymmetrical tread pattern, you know, they were a cool tire that worked really well on track, really well on road. And, <clears throat> you know, we realized really early on that, that the car could be better but you'd quickly ruin it trying to make it better. Yeah. So if, you know, we had the guys that had come to the track days in the fully specced out, tracked out RX-8s on the back of a trailer. Yeah. The guys that really had the fun were the guys that had the sense to turn up in a relatively stock car with a few mild modifications on them, OEM plus if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'd go out and you would enjoy the car all day. And you'd have a lot to talk about afterwards and you'd all come on fuzzing and that and that's what it were about for us that's what we enjoyed and so after 10 years of hardcore development building cars right up to that level of well we work with race teams you know we work with mac g racing i'll never forget getting in mac g racing's um uh R R bridge na rx8 that we built for them years and years ago and it's got a stage three um, extreme clutch in it, I think. I jumped in this car, you know, cage, helmet on, uncomfortable in a bucket <laughs> seat to go for a little test drive around Donington Park one day, which is their local circuit. And they set off out of pits, and it's. <laughs> and I'm looking at him like, shit, is this thing broken? And he's like, what are you on about? Why, why is it doing that? What are you on about? It's got a stage three clutch in it. <laughs> and it clicked in that moment. I was like, yeah, no, I mean, I've got guys that ring me up. They want a stage three clutch. That They don't need a stage three clutch. They want to put an upgrade clutch in the car. And that's all that matters to them. They put that upgrade clutch in the car and now suddenly it stinks when you're trying to reverse into car parking spaces. Your leg aches when you're driving up and down, getting stuck in traffic. <laughs> and from traffic lights, you look a pillock because you're trying to get flung out of the car. And then because you're using it on road and you're riding it all the time, you're setting off, you're slowing down. Race clutches, you set off, and then that's it. It's done. You know, its job is done. And um, and as a result, you know they've got such high clamping forces of these things that in 800 miles, the customer would wear a clutch out. Yeah. And then they ring me up and say this clutch should have lasted longer. <laughs> well, actually, that clutch was never meant to do what you've been doing with it, and that's why it hasn't lasted longer. Yeah. And so you know you've put this upgrade into your car, but you've upgraded it so much that your car's no longer usable in, on the road. And, it, well, not, not pleasantly anyway. And then what I tend to find is, after years and years of doing this, people will then try to modify their car even further in an attempt to make up for the fact that it's no longer a nice car to drive because they've modified it. So, um, you know, the, there's a really, fine line there's a, a balance and so 
you know, I don't know if any of you guys are, are aware, so I mean, you probably are. You'll have heard of Motorsport Performance and that rotary revs don't do rotaries anymore. <laughs> and, uh, not interested. Yeah, all right. Whatever. You know, I love cars. I love rotaries, but I love cars. Um, the rotary community, the rotary market, even never had the legs to take my business as far as I wanted it to go. I want to build the best cars in the world, the fastest cars in the world. I want to do. And so over all of the years that I've been building these cars, what I've found is that there's a there's a line and it's a very hard line. And you only need to pull a short shifter in that's a bit racy and suddenly your perfectly balanced fast road car feels like a race car and you don't want to drive your kids around in it anymore. Mm. Where it don't make you happy the way that it did before. And the fix for that is not to go deeper in and turn it into an all out balls to, <laughs> balls to wall race car. What you need to be doing is taking that short shifter back out, putting the factory one back in and being happy again. <laughs> you know, like that's, that is the way that it is. And I mean, you, you know, with, with your car, we yeah, yeah. sat down, we've spent many of hours sat in here discussing mods, discussing, and we've had all these conversations with you over the years. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, a few years ago, I had to, I left, well, I left Rotary Revs in, in the capable hands of somebody else. And it, you know, my influence on the direction of your car and the way that it's gone sort of left. And um, it, well, how, how do you feel generally about the way that it went? About? I mean, like, let's just let's just put it out there. What yeah. You, so you, it was, are, are you glad that you went that way? You? So it was definitely a big journey for me with my car. Um, I think what mainly what I should have really done is is preserve the car. Knowing how, knowing how rare they are. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I get that now, but, yeah. you know, hindsight's a, a wonderful thing. Yeah. It's all right sitting here now in 2021 when there's no cars left to go in. Oh, maybe we should have looked after them when we had them. <laughs> yeah. <you know>? But <laughs> we didn't know that. No, we didn't I, know. I, was, I could have swore blind that they brought a new car out in 2017 for uh, the 50th anniversary of the Rotary Mazda. Um, and uh, when that didn't happen, I was like, well, there's no way they're going to miss 2020. The centenary year of Mazda Corp, you know, Motor Corp, Corporation. Um, and for, you know, maybe it is still coming. And COVID got in the way or whatever, yeah, but yeah. whatever happened, happened. And, and we haven't got one. So we're faced with the very real possibility now that the Yorker, the RX-8 R3, is, yeah. is the last of its kind. Back in 2016, when we were putting racing beat exhaust on it, man, we didn't know that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and if I went back to 2016, I'd still sell you a racing. Well, I probably won't sell you a racing beat. I'd sell you a, a mil tech, but tech, yeah. only because I think that the racing beat's a little bit quiet for me. I do yeah. want something. I wanted to. I think that you should, you know, the, the RX8 should see. So you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not a purist. Yeah. I'm not going to slap you around face if you come in with a car that's uh, that's got aftermarket wheels on it. In fact, I love that. I think that um, you know they should be personalised. Yeah. But mechanically, there's a line. Yeah. And we need to stay on the inside of that line so that the cars are enjoyable. And whether you keep it yourself forever or it moves on to somebody else, it doesn't just come out two days a year for a track day and then ultimately break and get left in a shed somewhere for 10 years until somebody pulls it out like I'm seeing happening now with the RX-7s and uh, thinking that they found a unicorn uh, but then bringing it back here in 10 years time and me going oh mate I can't get the parts to yeah. turn this car back into what it's supposed to be because it's too far gone and that is that is just the reality of it. And we've seen it happen. Yeah, we have. You know, like it, we've seen it happen with the RX-7. Mm. The RX-7s now, they're exceptionally expensive cars if you can get them in any decent condition. Um, and the ones that were butchered during the noughties are too far gone. They yeah. Like they, they, they come in here and I pop the bonnet and I go, this car needs a restoration. It doesn't need repairing, it doesn't need an engine rebuild. It doesn't need just need tuning, which is what we get all the time. It's it, it's it's broken, yeah. you know, it's got a shoddy paint job on it. 
It's got suspension that's been butchered. It's got an engine in it that's been chopped to pieces. It's got a turbo kit on it that's leaking everywhere. It's got oil leaks. It's got it's just it's just a mess. Mm. All of the bushes are knackered. All of the uh, the diff. I mean we. We built a car not long ago that we're doing 350 horsepower pulls on dyno. We then set off to get, I think it, it needed wastegate work or something, so we, we set off to drive it to the fabrication shop, set off from some traffic lights, and its diff exploded. Like, you know, these, these things happen to old cars. And I think that, you know, anybody who's going out and buying an RX8 today, or anybody who owns an RX8 today, needs to be looking at that car. And rather than thinking, how much can I spend on crazy ports, how much can I spend on crazy suspension, how much can I spend on turning this car into some crazy ass street race car. Uh, they need to be looking at it and thinking, how can I put that same money into making sure that this car's still here in 10 years time. And so that pretty much sums up what rotary revs will be moving forward. And, uh, and, and that's that. So yeah, I mean, you could argue that we've come to the end of an era and that I'm you know, downing tools and I'm not gonna be hacking away at them anymore. But do you know what? I'm kind of proud of that. I'm glad that we've, we've gone through that evolution. I'm glad that the market's come through all of those different stages and that we've come to, I've certainly come to a conclusion that, um, that that's, that's what I want for the car moving forward. And, you know, I mentioned Motorsport and Performance. Motorsport and Performance is with, it's the same company. Well, technically it's the same thing. It's me, um, it's my brand, it's my company. It's the same building. Um, you know, when you're watching these videos uh, that we'll, we'll be putting out, so we're gonna put tech videos out, we're yeah. gonna do, we'll let you see behind the scenes. We've got engine rebuilds every single week. Um, we've got something rotary going on every single week, but when you're watching those videos, you're going to see other cars, um, Mustangs. So we've got, you know, we build thousand horsepower Mustangs now. We've recently started migrating across into the Audi markets as motorsport and performance. Um, rather than looking at these things as a negative or being uppity about it, I think that you should be seeing that what that's doing is it's bringing new investment into a company that at its core still loves the Rotary. Uh, you know, I kept the Rotary Revs brand. I didn't let it die. Uh, well, and Abbo, Abbo takes it very personally, guys. I'll have you know, I probably won't be sat here now talking to you if it hadn't been for him. Um, he gets quite upset when, when we're not getting much content out there for you. And so I promised him that, do you know what? Sod it, we'll, we'll, let's, let's give the Rotary guys some love. And, um, and we'll show you the love that we do give the rotary cars. So, you know, like that happens anyway, uh, but you guys have not been getting to see too much of it. And now it's time that you, it's time. Now, now that it's time that you do, yeah. So I've been here all along. Yeah. I have been here all along in the background. Um, I think you got to see me very briefly at the end of the car throttle videos. Uh, you've probably seen me wandering around in the background. I've never really been get into getting in front of the camera and doing these, doing these videos. Um, I've had a, a business to focus on and, and, and that's the reality of that. But all along, the direction, the purpose, all of the, all, everything that goes on behind the scenes has, has been me. And, and I guess, I suppose, yeah, it's probably time that I, I came out and, and showed you guys some of what it is that we actually have been getting up to over the yeah, years. Yeah, And so, um, you know, I, I get able to drop in a few sick videos and, yeah, and uh, yeah. Of cars spitting flames out on dyno. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I think the next video. Next video. The next video, we're going to. I plan on getting up some of the dyno graphs. So I've got six years worth of um, dyno graphs that yeah, we've accumulated yeah. for everything uh, RX7, RX8. Um, and, and, and I'll show you. I'll just show you. I'll show you what it is that we've found, what we've seen. Um, we ain't even just got dinographs from us either for a, for a good long while. Um, you know, the, the other companies in the UK that, that work on rotaries that bring their cars to us to test. Um, I'm going to show you their video, their, their graphs, that's, that's their business. But, you know, I can tell you hand on heart, or oh, wrong way around, <laughs> hand on heart. <laughs> I'm not a cyborg, I promise. Um, you know, like what, what we've done is, is proven. It's tested. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm, I'm giving you the facts, and that's uh, and, and that's what my business is built on. So yeah, I mean, everybody can all go and argue the toss on Facebook as much as you like, but I've got nothing to hide. 
I, uh, I don't need the rotary work anymore. The only reason that we still do it is because I have a love for them and, I'll, and, and I want to keep it alive um, for the car and for the community. So That's exactly what I'm going to be doing with my car as well. Yeah, man. So yeah, we've got an upcoming series on my car. Um, so obviously, some of you may know, I've um, sold my race extension on and I'm going to be going street pop. Street pop. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you've seen some upcoming videos on my car. We've already got the engine up. built. So it's, down, yeah. it's downstairs, so we've got loads of footage. I built it for him. So um, I don't build many engines nowadays, but I, built it, I built it for Abbo, especially. <laughs> you know, he said he wanted to see it happen. Um, and then I think <laughs> you made a quick 16 second TikTok video, didn't you? Yeah, and it's reached over half a million views half on TikTok. a million views on tiktok how's that happens just in one hit so yeah so you get to see my grubby fingers getting abos engine together and uh and yeah no we're excited all right guys so yeah. comments are welcome down below let us what you let ask us as know. many questions as you want yeah ask as many questions as you want let us know what you guys want to see and until then make sure you subscribe because we've got loads of content coming out and we'll see you all soon yeah man see you soon Man. You didn't actually do anything, did you? You just asked me a couple of questions. <laughs> you, you the thing is, is, I've got a lot to say, so, you know, it's going to happen.